So we will have folks um, arriving just as we begin. Life is extra hectic for folks across the province right now as we're managing power outages and flooded roads. And I've been so fortunate to have people staying in my basement um, as the highway is closed going back, which has been wonderful. Nothing like holding a six month old in your arms every day to make you feel alive. Also hard to get your work done. So we are just thrilled to offer you the second in this series this year. And um, our focus in our middle, engage, it's the, 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 the webinar series is called Engaging All Learners in the Middle Years. And this year's focus is equity, diversity, and inclusion. We are just delighted to have this focus. And each of the sessions has a different lens or layer depending on what the speakers want to share. Um, we want you to know that we are recording the session, um, but no one except for the speakers will show up in the recording. So don't worry, you didn't have to pick out a special outfit for today, just I had to get a haircut yesterday. That's my mic on, sometimes I'm funnier. Thank you so much, thank you, thanks Sean. So um, today's um, featured speaker is Sarah Florence Davidson and I'll introduce her again in a moment. Um, so the session is recorded, but only the speaker, the presenters will be in the, um, the recording. So don't worry about needing to change your haircuts or anything for now. Um, this is the second in this year's series. And so I'll introduce Sarah Florence Davidson in a couple slides, but we're just so happy to be here in partnership with the Greater Victoria School District, the Rural Education Advisory and UBC's Edith Lando Virtual Learning Center. In about a week, you will receive uh, a link to this recording by email so that you can rewatch sections if you'd like. You can also um, watch the first session if you didn't get a chance to watch it previously. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I live and I learn on, on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Silks Okanagan people as a settler guest. The Silks Nation is, to this day and every day forward, the rightful caretaker of this territory. It's therefore my obligation to acknowledge, to respect, and to learn from the Silk's knowledge, language, and history, as well as from their ongoing relationship to the land and the natural world. The Silks have taken care of these homelands for thousands of years, and now that I call this place home, it is also my obligation to aspire towards better understanding of how to engage in respectful acts of decolonization, both personally and professionally. Um, I've been so fortunate to work with local elders and knowledge keepers this fall um, to be learning from and with the land and I'm um, so fortunate to be um, have the opportunity to, to pick mountain tea from a, a, a secluded site um, with a known canopy to um, attend the floodplain site that the Silks Nation is um, really re-engaging re re with Indigenous plants to that space as a, as a, as a an opportunity to decolonize the space. And just this last week, I had the chance to be guided um, by Anona Campy again with another group of educators as we learned um, how vision quests are connected to pictographs from a Silk's perspective. And so I just want to speak to our opportunity as individuals to work with our local nations, to learn as we build relationships, to not be in a hurry but to feel an urgency that this is important while also not thinking that it should all just come to us right now. And that brings me to an opportunity to pass off to our main partner, um, SD61 and Sean Powell, who is the district principal of Middle Years. Thank you, Leighton. Thanks for introducing me too. Um, just a couple of things that I should have said, good afternoon, everybody that's middle school or interested in middle school learning. I'm glad you're here with us today. Uh, I'd like to highlight just that this series has been happening for a couple of years, and I'd like to just thank Leighton and Tammy Renyard, who's my neighbor at 61 in Greater Victoria, and Dave Shortreed, who's been behind the scenes mixing things and making sure that everything just runs smoothly. He's going to throw that up in the chat for you, just so that if you wanted to go back and look at some of those other sessions, thanks, Dave, just on cue, uh, that you could do and go back a couple of years when you do have time uh, to do so. So that's great. Um, I would also, just representing Greater Victoria, I'd like to recognize the Lekwungen-speaking peoples. So specifically, that is Esquimalt and Songhees 
nations on who traditional land we live, we learn, and we do our work. I was at a middle school the other day for Prodi Day, and uh, the, the vice principal in the room started talking. He spoke a lot about, and it tied in Leighton with you, is about taking that pause and taking time to reflect on the land that you live on, uh, what it means to you, and what you're committing to learn about it. For me, when I take pause or I'm taking a breath to try to ground myself to the land where, where I currently reside, it's always around the water. And it's usually on a warm day with those warm pebbles on the beach when I can really uh, find that peace. And so I just share the picture of a water, but it doesn't, it's not necessarily the ocean. It can be of any sort. Um, so I, as I said from the start, you're likely a middle school educator. Um, and that means you work with 10 to 15 year olds every single day. So for that, I thank you. I thank you for taking time after that work day um, to recognize, to celebrate and to grow as those that lead and teach that age group. Uh, I've been with middle school students in some facet of my career for the last 20 years. And it's a really, really special age group for me. I'd also like to, in case you haven't, I know he said hello to a lot of people on the way in and uh, shared that he'd had a um, past working relationship with them. But Leighton Schnellert is, um, is also a middle school person. Uh, definitely, you'll get that really quickly if you haven't. Today, he's going to be part educator, mostly facilitator, um, and he is an associate professor at UBC Departments of Curriculum and Pedagogy. Um, and so, Leighton, I've had an opportunity to work with you a little bit so far and always enjoy those sessions that you're facilitating. So, with that, from Greater Victoria, passing back over to you, super excited about this partnership that we've had and that we'll continue to have. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. I got a shout out, people. Sean and I are becoming best friends. Yes. I laugh at his jokes when he's when he's worried no one else is. Um, just in this moment, we invite everyone to, um, in the chat box, locate where you're coming from. And if you can, from Indigenous territory, but also maybe something that you're doing to build your relationship with the land, your, your local nation, maybe some way that you're work moving forward in terms of decolonization. It will be different for everyone and wherever we're at in the journey, we move from there. Just say hi in the chat box. Where are you coming from? What's some way you're connecting to local knowledge, to the land, maybe to decolonization. Wherever you're at will be welcomed and celebrated. As you do that, I'd just like to note that the BC Ministry of Education is a partner with us in this work, and they have an explicit focus on diversity, inclusion, and equity. And so we're so appreciative to be um, collaborating together as part of a project that our guest speaker and myself are, are part of called Growing Innovation in Rural Sites of Learning. And so we're so fortunate to have this support and this partnership and to be working across roles across um, uh, institutions even to say this is important work for all of us and we can all move forward from where we are. So thanks to the Ministry of Education and specifically to Denise Augustine, who is the Superintendent of Indigenous Education for the province. And that brings us to my dear friend who is still like, how did I end up signing up for a provincial webinar? I thought it was a small group. Sarah, I love you in a personal and professional way. Um, Sarah is an educator, a teacher, an author, a researcher, and perhaps most importantly to me, a critical friend who, though it's been virtual for the last couple of years, um, if she can't hold my hand literally, she literally holds my hand virtually every week. One of the first people to check in with me during the floods and the power outages was Sarah, who just texted me, how you doing? Also, she said, is the webinar still on? Um, which also lets you know that if we can't laugh together, if we can't cry together, then perhaps we're not in a place as educators where we can really do the deep work we need to with our middle years learners. So I thank you, Sarah, for joining us, for sharing your knowledge, for preparing this time with us. And just want to remind everyone, if you haven't been part of the series before, that we do go into breakout groups as a decolonizing practice. So it's not just a speaker speaking, but it's a chance for you to make meaning in those times. And with that, I give you, oh, I also put, Sarah, I put your website on the slide. 
with a little link there so people can see and look at your incredible resources over time. Off to you. Thank you so much, Leighton. That was quite the introduction. Um, I would like to share my screen. So I don't know if I can just override. Um, I'm going to continue and see what happens. Ooh. We'll see what, oh, there we go. Ooh, I had, they had me scroll through at the beginning. So you just got a little, uh, a little preview of what's going on. And this, uh, this image here is, um, was taken in hope. And uh, it, it feels like it's a lot different in, in a lot of the area where I am living on uh, traditional and ancestral and unceded Stalo territory right now. Um, I was saying to Leighton, I'm literally feet from the evacuation area, but we are, we live up on a hill. And so that means that uh, we are safe and definitely thinking a lot about the folks who are um, currently evacuated from lots of different parts of the province right now. Um, so I am grateful to be here with you today. I'm using noise cancelling headphones because we have a lot of action in the air and across the water and um, uh, also on the roads that are remaining here today. So um, this is a photograph uh, that was taken last summer on, um, uh, again, the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Stalo people where I live. And I have been incredibly grateful to be on this land right now. Um, and uh, last summer, especially through the pandemic and through a lot of different experiences that I was having that were really difficult, um, so grateful to be able to walk on the land, to be able to look at the sky and really grateful to those traditional stewards who made sure you know, that in caretaking the land before me, um, that I was able to have that really healing experience. I don't know where that's coming from. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, so my name is uh, Anjat Gusanvans, which means killer whale woman of the dawn. Uh, that's my Haida name. Um, I belong to the Yakut Janas clan, which is uh, the Raven clan from um, Haida Gwaii. And my father is Robert Davidson. Um, his Haida name is Otsandlantz, which means Eagle of the Dawn. He belongs to the Ch'af clan and um, from, from uh, the northern tip of Haida Gwaii. My mother is Susan Davidson and she identifies as a colonizer um, and asks that I identify her as a colonizer in this work. Um, she was adopted by my uh, great grandmother, my father's grandmother, um, into the Yakut Janas clan, so that my brother and I would have a clan. And um, the reason for that is because the Haida are matrilineal, which means we follow our mothers. I am an assistant professor at Simon Fraser University in the Faculty of Education. I co-authored a a book with my father called Palette's Pedagogy, and more recently, the Scotta Story Series. The first two just came out in uh, the end of September. I have a PhD in literacy education, so I'm super excited and happy to be here with all of you today to talk about books and reading and ways to engage in literacy in lots of different ways. I have nine years experience working with about grade six and up. And I also worked with adult learners. I worked in rural BC and I worked, worked in Yukon. And there's my information uh, website and Twitter and Instagram if you're interested in different resources. That tends to be what I, I share. Uh, on Instagram, you get a few dog pictures as well. <laughs> I have two puppies at home with me who are wonderful and take very good care of me. And uh, they show up in my social media feeds occasionally to bring some joy to the the people who are around. So just so you have a sense of what we're going to be doing today, um, we will be looking, I'll be talking a little bit about reviewing Indigenous resources. We'll have a little breakout session. I'm hopeful that at least one person in your group will have a resource that you can take a peek at and apply some of what we are talking about um, in your breakout session. Uh, we'll then talk about working respectfully with Indigenous stories. And when we're thinking about Indigenous stories, we're thinking broadly. We will 
specifically be talking about traditional Indigenous stories, but we're also thinking more broadly of lots of different kinds of, of storytelling by Indigenous peoples. We'll have another breakout session. And then for the finale, I've got loads and loads of books to tell you about. And Leighton may need to do a small virtual hook to take me away so that all of you can go home and, or I guess turn off and uh, carry on with your lives. So without further ado, um, and Leighton, if you don't mind just keeping an eye on the chat in case there are things that I should know about. I, I see the numbers, but I don't see the, the content. Okay. So I, I am a tea drinker. I'm gonna fill up on some tea and we will get started. So, um, so we're going to talk about reviewing Indigenous resources. And this information is in an article that I'll share with you afterwards that just in case you want to go back on it, but sometimes it's useful to also hear some of the different things. If you do have an absolute burning question, I'm not sure what the protocols are here, but if, if Leighton spots it and, and it feels like we have time, um, and if not, we can maybe connect um, in, another, in another way. So first of all, why do we review? We know our students best. And so uh, one of the things that happens is that we uh, love to see as teachers and myself included, love to see what other people have said or recommended. And, and uh, what I always say is as an educator, you know your students best. And so you can absolutely take a look at all of those lists and all those recommendations but please vet them, make sure that they are going to work with the students who are with you for, you know, for that year. Um, we want to make sure that we have respectful resources in our classrooms. And my ultimate goal, the little kind of, I don't know, um, subversive goal that I have is that I would love it if educators demanded such great resources that we were pressuring publishers to only create amazing and respectful resources. So I sort of feel like if we all are kind of looking to have these quality resources in our classrooms, and uh, that hopefully some of those ones that are really problematic will not continue to be published and sold, and we will have fabulous resources. Um, one, one thing I just would like to, and I will, you'll hear me continue to repeat this, it is important that we continue to re review our resources. So just because we thought it was fantastic, <coughs> excuse me, um, you know, a year ago, six months ago, 10 years ago, does not mean that it will continue to be fantastic today with new information. Um, there are some authors who were Indigenous a few years ago, um, are no longer Indigenous now. And so if we're talking about authentic Indigenous resources and uh, Indigenous voices, we really want to be sure that we are continuing to look at our resources. And especially because information changes um, and we, we become more knowledgeable. I think of, you know, where I was even, you know, six months ago, a year ago, my knowledge has changed, it's evolved. And so we want to be sure that we are continuing to stay on top of that. Oh, goodness. Okay, so just as a little note on language, uh, Indigenous content, perspectives, and pedagogies, and you'll hear me talk about those three terms. Indigenous content means that there's information in the resource that is about Indigenous peoples. It may or may not be written by Indigenous peoples, it may or may not be accurate, but something in that resource is connected to Indigenous peoples. If, we're, if I'm talking about Indigenous perspectives, the resource contains information that is presented from Indigenous people's perspective. Um, this may be videos, it may be books by Indigenous peoples, but we want to be, but, but when we're, we're looking at that information, it means that it is an Indigenous person sharing that information. Indigenous pedagogies has to do with how we are sharing the information. Um, if we think about the traditional ways that Indigenous peoples shared information with future generations, an example would be um, using storytelling to educate, um, drawing on the first people's principles of learning, and so it has to do with how we are teaching the material. And so that's just to kind of orient us as we go into this conversation. There are seven guiding questions um, for, you know, in terms of what I think about. And this, these questions kind of emerge from a lot of the work that I've done evaluating resources. Um, there are um, organizations who've evaluated resource. Uh, FINESC has information. 
Um, so I've looked at a lot of that. And then I've also kind of thought about what are the things that I look at when I'm looking at resources. I don't know if somebody has a mic on, but it's quite loud. Um, a little bit, I don't know. Anyways, I thought it was a little kind of, woo. Anyways, but I think it's okay now. Wonderful, thank you. So uh, we have seven, there are seven questions that I sort of put together. And this came out of a project that I was doing with teacher candidates um, because I really wanted to support folks, especially educators, to be able to do their own evaluations, to not be relying on other external people to evaluate resources and then just bringing them in without uh, looking at them ourselves. So who developed the resource? How are Indigenous peoples represented in the resource? Does the resource contain traditional Indigenous stories? Does the resource contain Indigenous art? Does the resource contain references or to or depictions of ceremonial information? Does the resource honour the diversity of Indigenous peoples? And does the resource portray Indigenous peoples authentically and accurately? And so those are the questions when I'm looking at a resource that I think, you know, that I, that I use to kind of question as I'm reviewing the resource. We may not always get the answers to those questions, but one of the things that I say to educators is that um, if I were to come into somebody's classroom and they were using a resource that I thought was problematic and I asked them about it, um, I would probably feel a bit more comfortable if they were able to talk to me a bit about the process that they went through to evaluate that resource, as opposed to just saying, you know what, I Googled, you know, and I, this was the first thing that came up, it had the most hits and that's why I'm using it. And so um, I feel like there's room for a bit of dialogue when, when there's been a little bit of a process followed and ultimately you will have to use your professional judgment about whether you want to use a resource based on the information you can find out about it. So in terms of who developed this resource, um, has this resource been created by Indigenous peoples? Has this resource been created in collaboration or in consultation with Indigenous peoples? How do you know? And so a really a helpful resource is the um, uh, uh, Strong Nations, which is an Indigenous uh, online bookstore. Um, she's done an incredible job of just presenting information about um, the, the ancestry of different folks. Um, there are other resources, I'll often Google authors to just find out what their ancestry is. Generally, if they're not sharing their ancestry or if they're talking about their European ancestry only, um, you would not consider that to be a resource that is um, been created by Indigenous peoples. Another example, um, you know, if it, there, there are definitely really wonderful examples of collaboration. So I'm thinking of Tons Moons, where um, a settler educator worked with um, the Haida community to create a resource. Um, and so if those collaborations exist, generally they are written about. People feel really good about those collaborations and so you're looking for evidence either of somebody's ancestry in their bio or online or you're looking for evidence that they collaborated with the community. How are Indigenous peoples represented in the resource? Uh, is the resource free from stereotypes? Has respectful language been used? Does the resource recognize the strengths of Indigenous peoples? An excellent resource, I cannot say enough good things about this resource, is American Indians in Children's Literature. It is an American resource. Uh, Dr. Debbie Reese, you can follow her on Twitter. You can um, go to this, this blog. There's a little tiny search bar in the top where you can put in the title of a book. Um, again, whether or not you agree with what she's saying about whether she recommends a book, you can learn a lot from re reading her reviews. So um, there have been books that I've sort of been, oh, I don't, you know, I don't really know. I don't, I, I kind of maybe don't feel great about it. I'll read her review and I find it really helps me to kind of get a better sense of it. I don't always agree, as I say, but I, I do learn a lot about evaluation and what might be problematic in some of the, the especially in children's literature. Um, so her focus is on children's and YA books, um, definitely more American focused, but she has uh, Canadian literature as well. Um, and so when we're looking at it, you know, you're just looking at 
what, uh, what, you know, what kind of language is being used. And the other part here is just recognizing the strength we'll often see indigenous peoples depicted as kind of helpless or, um, you know, unable to do things on their own. And so we wanna make sure, um, especially in uh, schools, uh, stories about residential schools that we're recognizing the strength and resiliency of indigenous peoples. Does the resource contain traditional indigenous stories? Um, and um, so we want to be sure uh, that the resource, um, uh, if it's got uh, traditional indigenous stories, we want to check to see that it has, uh, that permission has been given to use the story in a, in a public context or for educational purposes. Does the resource in indicate what protocols or guidelines, if any, should be followed when using the story? I'm going to quickly share an example with you. Uh, Beaver Steals the Fire. And this is a traditional story. And what it's got at the very back of it, which I found incredibly helpful, is it's got a note to teachers and parents. And at the back, this has all of the protocols that are connected to the sharing of this story. And so this particular story cannot be shared if there is not snow on the ground. And so uh, having those protocols uh, with, with the book itself are really, really helpful. Um, and um, so uh, the, I've got some suggested resources here, um, the Finesque Authentic First Peoples Resource Guide, um, and where they've done some of that vetting process and oyadi.org, how to tell the difference. These are both, I believe, on the little handout that you were sent um, before the, um, uh, before this moment, um, so check your email. Um, but these resources, uh, there's been a vetting process that has uh, already uh, happened, and so um, you'll you can kind of take a peek at at the process that people go through. What you want to think about with uh, traditional stories is that. Uh, you're looking for someone generally of the same nation sharing that story. So if you saw me, Sarah Davidson, sharing a Sim Shan story, you might have some alarm bells because I'm not going to know the protocols for sharing that story. So you want to see evidence that the story and the, the storyteller's nation are the same because um, then, then they are more likely to know some of those protocols for sharing the story. Does the resource contain Indigenous art? This is one that's really, um, uh, can be really problematic. Um, so when you see something, first of all, <laughs> there's no such thing as Indigenous art. Indigenous art tends to come from a specific nation. So when we're looking at art, whether it's a hybrid, it tends to belong or can be connected to a specific nation. When my father's doing art, it is Haida art. Um, it's often classified in this big umbrella of indigenous, but, um, but generally it's, it's connected to a specific nation. And, and again, that speaks to our diversity. Um, does the resource contain information about the artist, the artist nation? Um, and sometimes this, you'll see some artists will do art in the style of a different nation, uh, but you'll generally see them have a bit of a, uh, information about that. Does the art appear to have been copied from another source? And so this might be, you might see those random photocopies um, that are from the internet, and you really want to avoid those. You want to see information about the art. You want to see recognition of the artist. You want to see it connected to a nation. Um, because that shows that there has been a relationship with the artist and it's not just been taken for the purpose of indigenizing a particular resource. Does the resource contain ceremonial information? And um, it, this is particularly significant if it appears that the resource creator is not indigenous or does not belong to the nation represented in the resource. Um, so again, there's an accountability if we're sharing information from our nation, we have an accountability to our community and to our nation. And so we wanna be sure that if there's this kind of ceremonial information included, that it has been shared um, in ways that is respectful to the owners of that, that knowledge, um, to the nation, um, to the community. Um, and so if you, again, if you see that disconnect between the nation and the uh, person sharing the information, it's probably, it, it, it's, it, I think it's very difficult to know the specifics 
uh, from, from an outsider perspective enough to be able to share that information. Does the resource contain traditional songs and um, spiritual ceremonial practices? If so, is there evidence that permission has been given to share this information? And sometimes you may not see that evidence, but you will see that it's um, a Simshan person sharing Simshan information. So you might decide, you know what, I feel okay. I have to trust that this person knows the protocols around sharing this information. One thing that makes me really uncomfortable with ceremonial information is if there's enough information in a text that I feel that I'm able to replicate a ceremony without any knowledge of it. And so that's sort of a, a rule of thumb for me is if I, if I see something like that in a book, I, I sort of kind of steer away or I'm extra careful in reviewing it to be sure that um, I'm not, uh, first of all, I don't feel comfortable knowing that information and definitely not sharing that information. Does the resource honor the diversity of Indigenous peoples? Does the resource reference specific nations? And this is something that I've sort of talked about through all of them. Um, and that is because, uh, again, there's no Indigenous nation. We are separate nations. As if we think about um, European countries as diverse as all of those different countries. And so um, there's, there's not this sort of um, indigenous way of doing things. There are different perspectives that we may have in common, but we really want to make sure that we're recognizing the diversity and not try to lump indigenous peoples together. Uh, one exception is when the resources reference the experiences that might be common to many indigenous peoples. And so thinking about kind of experiences with colonization, experiences with residential schools, there might be some generalizability to that where we can talk about indigenous peoples you know, and as a larger group for those purposes. Does the author, um, sorry, does the resource portray Indigenous peoples authentically and accurately? To determine this, you must consider the references that are being used and or the people who have been involved in creating the resource as well as the resource itself. And so, um, for example, with Finesc, I have a lot of trust for Finesc, but I still want to review those resources and make sure that I feel comfortable using them in my classroom. But that's sort of a good clue that probably it is a strong resource. Um, if it's created by somebody that you respect as an educator, as an Indigenous educator, it's, you know, and you, you kind of know their work, it's probably okay. So you kind of maybe won't um, be as thorough in your review, you still want to review it. Uh, do the resource creators belong to a reputable orga organization? Does the resource contain factual and researched information? Has historical information been accurately portrayed? And so we just want to be careful and make sure that the information being shared is not sort of rumor or based on stereotypes or based on, on inaccurate generalization about Indigenous peoples. And so we just want to make sure that um, for example, um, oh, I love this book, uh, 47,000 Beads, amazing, amazing story uh, about um, a girl, uh, sorry, about Peyton, who uh, doesn't want to wear the regalia that is sort of can maybe considered by others to be the regalia that she should be wearing. Um, and I won't spoil for you what happens, but immediately I was wondering what are the protocols around regalia in this particular nation? And when I, so I did a little bit of research on the author. And so same thing, I just, you want to be careful um, and just kind of look into the backgrounds of folks uh, before you just sort of take whatever it is that they're saying to be to be true. Uh, I still didn't get to the bottom of um, the beliefs about the regalia, um, but based on my research into the author, I felt more comfortable about the book. And I actually really love the book. Um, so I am gonna pause there. I know that was a little bit fast, but uh, we are going to do a breakout um, moment, breakout group. I've put this lovely QR code up here for you. It's my first time doing a QR code for a little two page PDF. Um, and so I am, uh, you'll, you're going to go through those seven questions with, I'm hoping that at least one of you has a resource to take a peek at, if not find one online and just start kind of 
talking and I do recommend that you do this with your group or uh, yeah with your group it's really really valuable to have conversations when we're doing this kind of evaluation because different people have different perspectives and we can learn so much from each other doing this pro process collaboratively you might not have time to answer all the questions but what an opportunity to think about a resource with these questions in mind if you don't have a resource as a group you can talk about how might this apply to some of the resources you've used in the past.